Well, welcome again. We're glad to have you here for another version of our Reed and Christine Halliday Executive Lecture Series. Uh, today we have with us a special guest, Peter Johnson, who is president of Sinclair Oil. And uh, Peter, it's kind of fun to visit with him a little bit before, and I'll be quick because he has more interesting things to say than I do. But uh, Peter um, is a University of Wyoming guy. And, uh, and he's the head of their National Advisory uh, Council, or I, I suppose they probably call it, for, for their business school. And so I was, I was impressed for a couple things. Number one, that someone who heads up the Advisory Council for another business school would come and visit with our business school. And number two, that somebody who is a dyed-in-the-wool Wyoming cowboy fan would actually come to uh, Utah Valley, home of the, that rival team down the street, and join us. Uh, but we're really grateful to have him with us today. He has some interesting stories to tell, and I think you're really going to resonate with what he has to share with you today. So rather than go through the formal introduction, I'm going to turn more of the time over to Peter today and have him do that. Thank you. Uh, is this microphone working all right? Everybody hear me? We have the president here. I don't know if everybody noticed uh, President Holland came to, uh, to participate today as well. So um, brown and gold, University of Wyoming here. Um, I, have a, um, I have a real dedication to academia. Um, I doubt seriously that uh, any of you grew up in more modest means than I did. Uh, and as far as I know, there's only one path uh, up the staircase, and it's the path of education. Uh, I believe in education. Everybody asks me, what do I do to, what, what, should, you, what should one do to uh, advance their life, to advance their economic situation, to, to advance their opportunity for happiness? And as far as I'm concerned, there's only one answer, and it's education. Um, I pursued my education, uh, got my undergraduate degree in finance from the University of Wyoming, and then went on to law school, uh, invested three more years of my life in law school, practiced law for a few years, and then uh, moved back into management, and I'll talk about some of those things near the end. Um, I was once told that, a, uh, that, the, um, that the, the, the features of a good uh, sermon we're first, um, I tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I tell you what I'm telling you, and then at the end I tell you what I told you. Um, so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, talking about the petroleum industry in the world. Uh, you all uh, uh, pay heating costs, you buy gasoline, the goods you consume have uh, energy costs integrated into them. And so I think it's an important part of, uh, of our lives. Uh, in the last few weeks with what's happened in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, energy prices have again spiked. And so people pay more attention to the world petroleum uh, business than they might uh, otherwise. Um, I'd also like to tell you about a little bit about Sinclair Oil Corporation. I, I trust uh, some of you stop at a Sinclair gasoline station on occasion and buy some of our product, and I appreciate that. And then I'll spend a few minutes on kind of the decisions I made uh, as I was at your stage and, and thereafter in my own business career and, and what happened there. So let's see if this works. Um, world oil markets. A few years ago, um, you wouldn't have had this list uh, of, of, cri of major criteria that set the world oil market. But think back to 2005. Um, I don't know if you can see the laser pointer I've got. Uh, Mother Nature sent a couple of hurricanes onshore in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Rita and Katrina, and did uh, major infrastructure damage to the world uh, refining business. Um, greater sensitivity to uh, environmental risks. I don't think last summer anybody in America wasn't following what was happening uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, with the well rupture that occurred there. Uh, and today, uh, we've got uh, un unanticipated geopolitical events in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, the, world, world oil, the oil business is a global business. Uh, what happens in Libya does, in fact, 
affect the price you pay for gasoline in Salt Lake City. It may seem strange to you that it does, but the uh, world petroleum industry is integrated to the extent that whatever happens any place in the world, if a couple of refineries in France go on strike, uh, it affects the price you pay for gasoline in Salt Lake City. Uh, may not seem right to you, but in fact it's true. Um, so those are, those are the, today, the primary determinants of world energy prices. Um, geopolitical risks that we've all seen occur recently. Financial investors is one that's come into play recently. Um, I suspect we've got some students studying finance in here. Uh, a decade, 20 years ago, uh, a, a financial uh, instructor uh, would have taught you to diversify your investments among large cap stocks, small cap stocks, uh, growth stocks, um, maybe some bonds. Uh, in the end, every single one of those behaved exactly the same during the collapse of 2008-2009. Uh, that model of diversification didn't really, I don't think, do anybody very much good. On the other hand, a whole lot of financial advisors have moved to recommending a greater investment in hard assets, physical assets, or commodities. And um, the two uh, commodities that get held by investors the most are gold and oil. And there's a hundred times more oil traded on a daily basis than, than there is gold. So if you or your financial advisor are interested in getting into hard assets or commodities, the odds are you're going to be investing in oil. And when, when your, President, your retirement funds uh, are invested in oil, you're competing with me. You're buying that barrel of oil that I would like to buy and run in my refinery. You're buying it and putting it in your retirement portfolio. Um, so that drives the price of oil up because I'm competing with financial investors now uh, uh, ten years ago, I didn't. Ten years ago, you wouldn't have had any oil in your retirement portfolio. Uh, you wouldn't have been competing with me to buy that oil. This is, uh, I'm not sure if you can see that. This is kind of a historical uh, picture of petroleum refining in the United States. And, um, and the thrust of it is, as compared with some years ago, petroleum refining has tended to get more consolidated. Um, I suspect uh, most of you have studied a bit of economics, um, and while the petroleum refining industry is clearly not monopolistic by any stretch, a fewer number of competitors is generally constructive to uh, the economics of an industry. Uh, and, and with the exception of a, of a couple of spin-offs in the last few years, by and large, uh, the petroleum industry in the United States has tended to consolidate into fewer and fewer hands. This is, um, a, let me comment just a minute. The, the, um, the laws of supply and demand are going to evidence themselves in several slides that I'm going to show you today. Um, price of crude uh, over the time period here has ranged from the, the uh, 20s to, the, to $150 a barrel in the summer of 2008, down to $30 a barrel by 2009, and back up to $100 today. And what you can see on this chart is that uh, the U.S. domestic production of crude oil peaked in the early 80s at about uh, nine million barrels a day. That's millions of barrels a day. And, uh, and then uh, 100 plus dollar oil, in fact, makes a difference. Even in a country that's been explored and drilled as extensively as the United States, $150 oil elicited a supply response. Uh, supply and demand does, in fact, the laws of supply and demand do, in fact, uh, function uh, with a certain delay. Investment in the petroleum industry is long-lived and, uh, and oil prices cross the $100 barrier and, uh, and energy production in the United States 
turns up, resulting in a, um, a capping or uh, a, a ceiling on the uh, amount of crude oil that we import into the United States. If you remember the number from the other page, it was about 9 million barrels a day of domestic production and about 10 million barrels a day of imports. So um, a couple of years ago, we were importing more than 50% of the uh, oil that we consume in our country. Um, that may not be a concern to some, it's a concern to me. It has a profound impact on balance of payments. When we import uh, 10 million barrels a day of crude oil, uh, it's very difficult for the U.S. to ever get a trade balance. We're sending so many dollars overseas for oil that we can't export enough products to ever get back to even. Uh, of, of, of even greater concern is where the bulk of those um, dollars go. And frankly, uh, an awful lot of those dollars go into hands uh, where some of that money ends up in terrorism. Uh, it's not supposed to, uh, but the fact of the matter is um, some of that 10 million, 10 million barrels a day of oil, some of that money ends up in the wrong hands. And uh, it's probably not in our country's national security interest to be sending as many dollars uh, into those kinds of hands as we do. This uh, is something I'd like you to, to pay attention to and think about. Um, the United States uh, has relatively modest oil reserves. We're producing 10 million barrels, a, uh, excuse me, about 9 million barrels a day. We were producing 9 million barrels a day. Today we're producing less than that. We have about 20 billion barrels of oil reserves. Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, has 260 billion barrels of oil reserves. Here's the interesting part of this. Canadian oil sands contain 175 billion barrels of oil reserves, and oil shale, just oil shale in, in, in Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming, eastern Colorado, southern Wyoming, western, eastern Utah, southern Wyoming, western Colorado, have more barrels of oil reserves, recover, these are recoverable oil reserves, than uh, OPEC. Uh, there are environmental challenges, there are technological challenges, but the resource exists within the United States to, uh, to be energy independent if the environmental hurdles could be crossed and if the technological hurdles could be crossed. So, excluding oil shale and excluding oil sands in Canada, uh, so of traditional petroleum reserves, OPEC has 80% of the reserves in the world. Uh, it's not difficult to understand how uh, an OPEC decision to reduce production or increase production has an impact on the price of oil and the price that we pay at the pump in Utah. In spite of, uh, of uh, substantially less oil reserves than Russia or Saudi Arabia, the U.S. produces uh, a substantially greater proportion of our reserves. The, the most exploited provinces in the world are in the United States. We have done more to exploit the natural resources that are under our ground than any other country in the world. And I think everybody probably knows the United States is the uh, largest petroleum consumer, the largest energy consumer in the world. Um, I'll talk a minute uh, uh, about China. Um, in the last three or four years, China actually went from a, a crude oil exporter to a crude oil importer. Uh, China produces about 4 million barrels a day today and consumes about 8 million barrels a day today. So they are the world's second largest importer of crude oil as contrasted with as little as four or five years ago, China was actually a crude oil exporter. Uh, has a profound impact on the world balance of crude oil. 
Uh, we are now competing with China to buy the world's crude oil and import it. I, uh, I hope you'll find this interesting and thought-provoking. In the United States, uh, each of us consumes about 22 barrels of oil a day. The lights in this room, to some degree, may be generated by, the electricity may be generated by oil. Clearly, uh, your cars use oil. The goods that you consume, that computer was transported here probably in a truck that burned diesel fuel or on a train that burned diesel fuel. So we consume 22 barrels uh, per year, each of us on average, uh, of oil. South Korea, a developing country, some might even say a developed country, consumes 15 barrels of oil a day. Average, a, per, average per capita consumption of oil in South Korea. You don't have to answer, but think for a minute what you think the energy consumption in China is. China has over a billion people, a multiple as many people as the United States does, a greater multiple as many as South Korea does. Um, energy consumption today in China is two barrels per capita per year. Um, it's probably not reasonable to think that within a decade China could achieve the United States standard of living of 22 barrels of oil per capita per year. But I don't think it's unreasonable to think that in a decade China could achieve South Korea's standard of living, uh, which means they're going to con consume seven times as much oil when they reach that level as they are today. Um, we're going to be competing to a greater degree than, than ever, a greater degree than most of us can imagine. We're going to be competing with China for the world's energy resources. Just think about um, China consumes uh, four, 8 million barrels a day, imports 4 million barrels a day of crude. Multiply that times 7 to achieve South Korea's standard of living. Um, that's, that will roil the um, world oil markets. It's something um, that frankly nobody knows the answer to, but the odds are we're all going to experience it. So the U.S. makes up about 4% of the population and consumes about 25% of, um, of the world energy consumption. Um, in a few years, that's probably not going to be true as the rest of the world competes for that energy. I mentioned earlier the, uh, the crude oil price as it, as it uh, moved through the last uh, decade or so, uh, starting out at about 20 bucks uh, in 2002, ran up to $150 a barrel in the uh, summer of 2008, along with an awful lot of other commodities in the world, real estate, uh, being another fine example, uh, energy prices ran up, uh, fell to 30 bucks a barrel uh, as the world went through the Great Recession and have recently recovered to about the $100 level. Um, gasoline demand, again, uh, you see uh, two decades of, uh, of constant growth. The, uh, the wiggle of the line is seasonality. Uh, think about yourself. You probably drive more in the summer than you do in the winter. Everybody else does. So gasoline demand in the United States, which is the primary uh, petroleum demand in the United States, is gasoline. Gasoline demand in the United States peaks every summer and troughs every winter. Uh, Utah has a greater degree of seasonality, and our demand swings every year than the nation as an average does. Uh, so what you see in, in Salt Lake City oftentimes are in the summer, gasoline prices in Salt Lake City will be near the national highs. And in the winter of every year, gasoline prices in Salt Lake City will be near the national lows. Uh, exactly for that seasonality, the seasonality of demand in Salt Lake City is more extreme than uh, in most of the rest of the country. 
But you can see how the laws of supply and demand work. Uh, in, uh, in 2008, when, uh, when energy prices peaked, uh, gasoline prices peaked, uh, and demand fell off. Uh, unfortunately, an awful lot of that demand fall off was directly related to unemployment. A uh, significant amount of gasoline uh, consumption occurs with people driving to work every day. And when you've got 9 and 10 and 11 percent unemployment, uh, you've got 9 or 10 or 11 percent of the people that aren't driving to work every day, and it, uh, it severely impacts uh, petroleum demand. Um, another thing that has historically increased over time, although in the last couple of years has, has lightened up a little bit, is um, price volatility. The average daily change in the price. If it goes up a nickel today and down a nickel tomorrow, price of gasoline goes up a nickel a gallon today, down a nickel a gallon tomorrow, that's not the same as having stayed flat for two days. Volatility uh, substantially increases risk in business decision making. Um, three years ago before the collapse of 2008, an awful lot of business people didn't consider risk uh, and volatility as an important part of their business decision making or business model. Today, uh, gasoline price volatility in the four and five cent a gallon range, if you think about your local gas station that you go to, in a good month, they make less than four or five cents a gallon. Um, so if they happen to make the decision to buy their gasoline on the wrong day, uh, their profitability is gone. This volatility swamps retail profitability. So management of, of purchasing, even at the local single gas station level, becomes critically important as price volatility increases over time. This is a chart of, of, uh, of uh, gasoline prices nationwide, 2009, 2010, and so far in 2011. Um, you can see with, uh, with uh, uh, it doesn't include 2008 when crude oil peaked at $150 a barrel. But you can see there's been a fairly consistent increase in gasoline prices as the U.S. has recovered and the world, frankly, has recovered from um, the recession that started in 2008. This is interesting. I'm not sure you'll be able to read it, but um, Utah is located in um, uh, a, a allocation district uh, called the Rocky Mountains. And you can see here the uh, average uh, street gasoline price on Monday of this week. So you can see uh, where the Rocky Mountains fit in with, uh, with other petroleum markets. And again, the Rocky Mountains tend, Utah in particular, tends to, uh, to have higher gasoline prices in the summer month than the national average and lower gasoline prices than the national average in the winter months. So um, about two weeks ago, oil prices spiked $15 a barrel. Uh, based on the political unrest in uh, Libya, uh, and before that, what happened in Egypt, although Egypt's, although it's in the Middle East, it's not a very big energy player. So here's what happens, uh, the economists tell us, with a $10 increase in the price of oil, uh, de decreases GDP by a quarter of a percent. So we had about a $15 a barrel run up in energy prices a couple of weeks ago. Uh, decreases GDP by about three-eighths of a percent. Uh, and obviously increases the number of dollars we send overseas every day to buy oil. A question we oftentimes get is what's the timeline for the barrel of or the gallon of gasoline you buy? Uh, and kind of roughly this is, this is how it works. Uh, once a barrel of crude oil is produced domestically in the U.S., this isn't a barrel of crude oil produced in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, for example. Once a barrel of crude oil is lifted out of the ground in the U.S., takes a week or two to get to a refinery, 
couple of weeks to, uh, for, for a refinery to turn it into gasoline and diesel fuel, gasoline in your case. And, uh, and then by time it moves through pipelines, moves through terminals, moves through a truck and ends up at your local gas station, it's, uh, it's taken about uh, 23 days and then uh, a turnover inside a gas station is a couple of days. So it's about a month and a half after a molecule of crude oil comes out of the ground until you're burning it in your car. Here are um, kind of the future looking issues uh, for the uh, petroleum industry primarily in the United States, globally to a lesser degree. And that is uh, the future of biofuels and what the U.S. chooses to do on global warming legislation, sometimes called greenhouse gas legislation. Biofuels are such things as uh, ethanol uh, and biodiesel. Uh, today, the gasoline you buy probably has about 10% ethanol in it. So when you buy a gallon of gasoline, you're probably buying about nine-tenths of a gallon of traditional gasoline and about a tenth of a gallon of ethanol. Um, the ethanol component doesn't stand economically on its own. Uh, ethanol only gets into the marketplace by governmental mandate and by governmental subsidy. Uh, nobody can explain to me why we need both, but we have both. Uh, it's, it's mandated how much ethanol I have to sell every year, and every time I sell a gallon of ethanol, I get a subsidy uh, from the government to do so. Uh, and every petroleum refiner is in the same uh, situation. Um, so the future of biofuels turns entirely on one of two factors, either uh, a technological breakthrough that makes uh, ethanol or biodiesel economically viable standing on its own, or uh, a, a decision by uh, the government of, of how much money they want to spend either subsidizing it or mandating it, uh, because biofuels can't uh, stand on their own. Global warming legislation is, um, is really interesting. To a very high degree, uh, the standard of living of a country is directly correlated to its level of energy consumption. I was commenting to uh, President Holland earlier. Um, I got to come down here to, to, to uh, Utah Valley University today uh, because energy is cheap enough in the United States and it's mo readily available enough that I could drive my car from Salt Lake City down here uh, today. Uh, there are parts of the world where you wouldn't do that and couldn't do that because of the price of energy. Um, standard of living is defined by infant mortality rate, level of education, level of alcoholism, uh, 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 average life expectancy, family size. It, standard of living isn't nearly so much a question of whether I drive a Mercedes or I drive a Chevrolet. It's measured by, by the, the more important factors I just mentioned. And so when when you undertake uh, reducing energy consumption, either by allocation or by price, uh, there is a direct reflection on standard of living. So the question a country faces in adopting uh, global warming legislation is the degree to which they wish to sacrifice their standard of living uh, for the future, uh, for the potential future impact of less greenhouse gas emissions. Um, others may disagree with me on that point, um, but that's my opinion and I'm here to share my opinion with you. Um, I'd like to shift now for a few minutes and talk about uh, Sinclair Oil, the company uh, that I'm president of. Um, here is kind of a structure of, the, of uh, the petroleum industry. There's upstream, which is exploration and production. That's the business of, of finding oil underground and then bringing it out of the ground so that it can be used. Uh, midstream, which is pipelines, uh, terminals, uh, processing facilities that process natural gas. And then downstream, 
which is refining and distributors and all the way to the retail store. Uh, that's the uh, downstream business. Sinclair is involved in uh, all three aspects of the petroleum business, although we are predominantly a, a petroleum refiner. So we are predominantly involved in the downstream uh, end of business. Um, for, uh, for a college of business, for business school graduates, these are the kinds of jobs, I guess uh, law probably doesn't fit that, but these are the kinds of jobs that, uh, that we hire uh, business school graduates for. Um, and, and largely these functions for our company are in uh, our office in Salt Lake City. Our, our headquarters is in Salt Lake City and, and these people uh, by and large work there. This is a kind of a busy map, but that is, um, those are the Sinclair branded uh, gas stations uh, around the Western United States. That's our geographical market area. Um, we used to have a Sinclair gas station just at the entrance to the university here, uh, and it got taken over by the state for some road project that I don't think I can understand, but it happened anyway. Here's, um, here's just some interesting uh, information on our, on our company. Uh, 2,200 branded uh, Sinclair stations. Uh, we supply gasoline. We supply jet fuel. Um, we supply asphalt. We're a significant asphalt supplier in Utah, Wyoming, Colorado. Um, so uh, Union Pacific Railroad is a major customer of ours. Delta Airlines is a major customer of ours. Um, and this is an interesting picture. I don't know if you're able to see it. Um, for the Olympics in 2002, when President Bush came to attend the closing ceremonies, um, if I recall correctly, um, he flew Air Force One in and, uh, and we, we refueled Air Force One. We supplied the jet fuel to uh, fuel Air Force One. And those Olympic rings were, were uh, on the hill above Salt Lake City. So the, actually the military commander uh, that was responsible for this aircraft while it was on the ground uh, went and took this picture of Air Force One with the Olympic rings in the background and sent it to me uh, as a memento of having provided the jet fuel to, uh, to refuel Air Force One so it could fly on. So that may not mean as much to you as it does to me, <laughs> but, but it was still a fun time for us. Uh, here are, in, in Utah, our competitors. Um, it's kind of interesting. You may see the, you will, you will see the Phillips name up there twice. Uh, about a decade ago, Conoco and Phillips merged to create a merged entity called Conoco Phillips. When they merged, the FTC required them to divest uh, several refineries. One of the refineries they had to divest was the one in North Salt Lake. And so when they sold that refinery in North Salt Lake to Holly, they also had to give Holly the right to use the Phillips brand. So in, in Salt Lake City, in Utah, if you go into a gas station that has the Phillips brand on it, uh, you're not actually buying gasoline from ConocoPhillips, you're buying gasoline from Holly because they have the right to the, Holly brand, to the Phillips brand in certain markets, including Utah. Well, there's me about 60 years ago, 58 years ago. And if you look right down there, I was standing in the back room of my dad's gas station, uh, my dad's Sinclair gas station. You can see a drum of Sinclair grease uh, there that I'm standing in front of. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes and, and kind of chat about my career. I, um, I received my undergraduate degree in finance from the University of Wyoming and um, just as, as in picking stocks, I don't know, uh, some of you have probably studied stock price movements. Um, stocks in an industry tend to move in a highly correlated fashion. Uh, whether you invest in IBM or HP, uh, those two stocks are going to move in a highly correlated fashion. The big decision is not whether you invest in IBM or HP, the big decision is probably whether you invest in IBM 
or Exxon, completely different industry. Well, I took that same view uh, to, uh, to uh, selecting my career. I felt strongly that I wanted to spend my life in an industry that was focused on long-term fixed assets. I'd seen friends go to work in trading companies, software companies, telephone companies, and uh, brokerages, and those kinds of jobs tend to come and go with a fair amount of regularity. You know, you'll read, you'll read about a New York a bank laying off several thousand people. It's relatively easy to do that when you're not in the fixed asset business. When you invest in assets that are expected to have a hundred year life, a refinery, when we build a refinery, when we build a refinery unit, when we build a pipeline, uh, we're building an asset that we expect to own and operate for a hundred years. Uh, takes maintenance, takes upgrades, but that asset will be in business for a hundred years. And, and early in my career, I made the decision that it was prudent to invest in a business that invested in long-term fixed assets. May be something that appeals to you or it may not, but it, um, it surely worked out for me. I also quickly realized that, um, that education was what made the difference. Uh, you have to have a work ethic, you have to have integrity, you have to have loyalty, you have to have judgment, um, but you have to have education. And so I made the decision early on that a bachelor's degree wasn't uh, all the education I needed. So I went on and got a law degree, uh, practiced law for a few years, and then moved into management uh, in the oil business and have spent my life in management, but highly valuing the extra education I got by, uh, by getting a law degree. A week never goes by that I don't use what I learned in, uh, in furthering my education beyond uh, merely a bachelor's degree. So, made a, made a decision on, on an industry uh, or a class of industry I wanted to spend my life in, made a decision on uh, the level of education I wanted to get, and I feel like uh, there's a third component that's really important, and that is, um, Success in a career uh, isn't a 40-hour-a-week process. It isn't even a 60-hour-a-week process. Uh, there aren't very many weeks I only work 60 hours and, and have done that for, for several decades. And to be able to do that, you have to have the buy-in of your partner. Um, if you're working 60 hours a week and it's creating problems at home, uh, you're probably not going to keep working 60 hours a week very much longer. So my advice to students is that as you pick a career and pick a level of dedication you are willing to give to your career, uh, you better have the buy-in of your partner. Because uh, I can tell you I've got people that work for me now and I've had people that work for me in the past that aren't in that situation and it makes uh, success really difficult, because the fact of the matter is you aren't going to succeed uh, if you think you're going to work at 8 o'clock in the morning and coming home at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you don't get to be president of the university doing that, I can promise you that. So those were my comments. Um, it's a little difficult, uh, but I'd, I'd sure love to take some questions uh, if any of you uh, are interested. I'll do my best to be able to see you. I see one on the aisle here. Per perfectly fair question. Did everybody hear the question or should I repeat it? Okay, the question is um, over a short period of weeks uh, with Libya taking one to two percent of the world's oil supply off the market, price of gasoline in Utah goes up 40 or 50 cents a gallon, 
oil from Libya doesn't even come to Utah. If it did, it would take weeks to get here. What's the justification for why price of oil in Utah goes up 40 or 50, price of gasoline in Utah goes up 40 or 50 cents a gallon when something happens in Libya? Is that a fair summary of the question? Um, an economist would tell you, and I believe, that the, that the price of a commodity is based on the perceived cost of resupply. So if I bought a barrel of oil a month ago and paid 80 bucks for it, and I refined it into gasoline, the price at which I sell that gallon of gasoline is not based on my cost of buying that crude a month and a half ago. It's based on my perception of what it's going to cost me to buy the next barrel of crude oil that I'm going to refine into the next barrel of gasoline. You may not like that theory, but I think if you talk to your macroeconomics professor, I think he or she will subscribe to that. Price of a commodity is forward-looking, and it's based on the perceived cost of resupply. Um, the world oil, uh, the, the oil market is a world market. Um, I bring gasoline to Utah from a, a refinery in Oklahoma. Some of the gasoline that you have bought here in Utah, I brought here from Oklahoma. That's the incremental supply into, into Utah, comes from that far away. Refineries in Oklahoma do, in fact, uh, process uh, offshore crudes, and the price that they pay for offshore crudes, the price they pay for domestic crudes, is driven again by the perceived cost of resupply, by the price of the next barrel to be produced. So while it may not seem right, and you may not like it, uh, the fact of the matter is when something happens in the world, the price of all of the oil in the world goes up or down. Um, the, I showed you the chart of 2008 where the price fell from 150 bucks a barrel to 30 bucks a barrel. Was there justification within Utah for the price of oil to drop from 150 bucks to 30 bucks a barrel? Of course there wasn't. But there was a worldwide justification. So when the price of, wor the, of oil drops in the world, price of gasoline everywhere in the world drops as well. I don't know if that's a, an explanation that, that uh, satisfies you but uh, it's, his best, it's the best I can do of, of what I believe the facts to be. Sir? So what is the best way to shield us from those huge fluctuations in <coughs> oil companies' ideas and positions? I don't think there's a way to shield uh, a, a particular market from the volatility of the world market. Um, if you think you can build a petroleum reserve, the United States has a huge billion barrel petroleum reserve. If you think you can build a petroleum reserve and trust your government employees to manage that petroleum reserve in such a way that it reduces the world volatility of petroleum prices, then you've, you've probably accomplished something. But it is not possible uh, other than price controls, and they obviously are very short-lived, it's not possible to insulate the U.S. or any other market from the volatility of the larger world oil market, in my opinion. Sir? How is the moratorium on the Gulf Coast, the Gulf Coast um, that's a really good, oh, I'm sorry, let me repeat the question. I apologize for not repeating your question. Question is, how has the moratorium on drilling in the Gulf of Mexico affected Sinclair? Um, interestingly enough, here's how that moratorium has affected Sinclair. Um, companies that drill in the Gulf of Mexico also drill elsewhere, both in the world and in the U.S. And what we've seen very directly, I. We've drilled historically in the Gulf of Mexico. We haven't drilled anything in the Gulf of Mexico in 10 years, and so it hasn't affected our oper Sinclair's operations directly. But what I have seen from other companies that we buy crude oil from and that we deal with is that uh, dollars, budgets, that would have been spent in 2011 and 2012 drilling in the Gulf of Mexico those budget dollars, drilling budget dollars, are now moving inland. 
and there is, um, is a huge uh, significant expansion of development in oil production, oil drilling in Utah uh, because budgets got reallocated from the Gulf of Mexico to the continental U.S. and those dollars are now drilling uh, inland in the U.S. And so for my company, that's really a great thing. There's going to be more domestic production uh, in the markets that we buy crude oil in and refine than there would have been. It may not be such a good thing for the country because in total the U.S. will be producing less crude, but for my markets more crude will be produced inland. Does that make sense? Sir? Right. That that's a that's a good question. It's an, it's another question we get uh, asked fairly frequently. The um, you see a, a transport truck driving down the road uh, in Utah. It's about ten thousand gallons of gasoline, uh, maybe eight thousand gallons of gasoline. The typical additive level in an 8,000 gallon transport truck of gasoline is about a quart. Uh, I can put a quart of anything in that 8,000 gallons of gasoline and you won't know the difference. Um, gasoline specifications are dictated by the Federal Environmental Protection Agency and by state uh, regulatory agencies. So uh, in my younger days, in your younger days, uh, there were questionable qualities of gasoline that sometimes made it to market. In today's world, uh, the amount of uh, injector cleaner that has to be in every gallon of gasoline before it can be sold in Utah or transported in interstate commerce is all regulated by state and federal agencies. and. Um, if I, if I gave you uh, two gallon samples of gasoline from two different refiners and asked you to find any chemist who could distinguish which gallon came from one refinery versus another refinery, they couldn't do it. Uh, specification of gasoline is very fixed today by primarily by federal air pollution regulations. Is that I hate doing? to bring a close to this because I know there's a lot of interest in the topic and, uh, and uh, Mr. Johnson will be up here for a few more minutes afterwards, but we'd like to express our appreciation for your visit you here today much. and uh, you. presenting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.